All right. Uh, thanks, AJ. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, guys. Uh, I went to Metacritic last year. It was awesome. If uh, you guys got to bring five more people this year or get five more guys at your parish. Uh, just a little quickly. First, we're doing Defending the Faith. Uh, hopefully, by the end of the day, this is not what you look like because this is a girl. Um, so maybe that's what you're coming into today thinking, like, how would I defend the faith? I look like a 12-year-old in karate. Um, at the end of today, we want you to be ninjas, black belts, and men, like ripped men, like Kevin's boys playing football on the gridiron, right? So that's our goal today. Uh, just a quick bit by introduction. This is uh, a pilot event that we're doing, Defending the Faith, for through our office, uh, through our Galilee U initiative. So Galilee U is what we do at the Archdiocese for adults. Uh, leaders and uh, just regular adults in our parishes to learn and grow in their own faith. So if you're interested in hosting uh, a Galilee U event, we do this. We do a, an event called My Parish Matters. Uh, we do Called and Gifted, which how many of you guys did Called and Gifted with us last year as part of Men of Christ? That was pretty awesome, right? So we uh, we run that a few times a year. We also do Healing the Whole Person. Uh, I brought a lot of stuff on the table in the back uh, with the big banner uh, in the corner. So stop by and uh, grab some stuff on your way out. Uh, this event and everything our office in particular does is funded through the Catholic Stewardship Appeal. Uh, I don't say that as a like plug for your money, but just to like, if you do give to the Catholic Stewardship Appeal, thank you. And it goes to funding this kind of stuff. It does not go to funding like the tribunal or the, the essential things of the archdiocese. It goes to fund these really critical things uh, at the arch. All right, AJ already kind of took us through the schedule. Again, right, if you have a si uh, one of the breakouts that you want to go to, choose. Do one of Mike's, do one of mine, do both of Mike's. He's better than me. Uh, he's way smarter. Uh, I just steal his notes and then, like, try to imitate him, as you'll see, because we kind of look similar, too. Um, great. Uh, this is me, again. Uh, AJ gave me an intro. This is my family. We went to the zoo last week. This is a fresh picture. Look at that. Uh, it's, it's chaos and insane. So I love being here because it means I'm not there. No. Um, uh, I love you, honey. It was my wife's birthday yesterday. Uh, guys, my wife is so awesome. You know what she wanted to do on her birthday? She's like, can we go shoot guns? I'm like, uh, yes, absolutely. So we went to, uh, the firearms range over in Brookfield and we went to Sluggo's for a fish fry. It was awesome. All right. So let's talk about uh, evangelizing apologetics. This first session is going to set the stage for apologetics in general for us. And then we're going to get nitty gritty into those topics during the breakout sessions. That's how this day is going to work. Uh, you have a handout coming around. There's some stuff on there. Uh, it's really just the stuff you'll see on the slide. So uh, let's see here. So first, uh, let's start with the very beginning, right? Apologetics. What does that word mean? Comes from a Greek word, right? Apologia which means to make a defense, right? Which means uh, when you are going to be called to uh, a trial and sit on the witness stand and give a testimony. Guys, this is the first and most fundamental thing to learn about apologetics is that it is not apologizing for being Catholic. Sometimes we think that, right? But it is not, ap apologetics is not apologizing for the faith. It's giving a defense, Right, So if you read even the, the early accounts in the catechism or the, from the church fathers, people like St. Irenaeus, uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Justin Martyr, St. Polycarp, these guys are writing, they're giving an apologia right, of their faith, why they're doing this. And they're doing it in the context of a trial because they're on trial in Rome right, for, for being Christian. So that's what that word means. We got to start there. Uh, that's an art of giving defense of what we believe. So uh, why should we care? It's a good question to ask for anything in life, right? Like, why should I care about this? Um, well, there are three main reasons why you should care about apologetics. The first uh, is that loving God, is that something you want to do? Probably, I'm hoping, right? You're not here if you don't want to love God. Loving God requires that we know something about him. And knowing about God helps us to love him more. Right. How many, a lot of you are married, right? Uh, you can love your wife better when you know, and then when you remember, and like what Kevin said, when you activate the knowledge that your wife likes carnations and not roses because she's allergic to roses, right? One is loving, one is dangerous, right? That knowledge helps you love her better, right? Uh, I cannot love what I do not know. 
So if you've been on the sidelines, if you've just been kind of showing up for mass and go, but not like you've re resisted going to your men's group or other opportunities at your parish to learn about the faith, you are, you are, you are cutting off this opportunity to love the Lord. Because the more you know about him, the more you can love him. The more you know about his bride, the church, the more you can love her and through her love him as well. The more you learn about Mary, his mother, the more you can love him. So that's the first reason, right? The more I love about God, the more I can love him. Uh, the second reason, uh, right here, uh, the Lord commanded us very specifically to spread the faith, right? Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of Catholics and Christians think that Jesus' words end there. But there's a whole other clause after that. Baptize them and teach them to what? Observe all that I have commanded you. So it's not just teaching. We're going to talk about apologetics. Apologetics is not shouting into the void the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't need that from us. God does not need us to just shout into the void of social media uh, what is true. He's the truth. He can take care of himself. What he does need us to do is help guide people to observe the truth. And that's a very different thing. Those of you who have sons, you know that's a very different thing, right? To teach them and to have said the words is different than to have acted upon them. So we have a very clear uh, directive from our Lord to do this. Uh, again, First Peter, I'm sorry, Acts 2.42, the very first Christians, right? They found themselves, uh, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. From the very beginning, the first Christians were devoted to the teaching of the apostles, which is the church, the teaching of the church. And then we have another scripture passage here, 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. So St. Peter, our first pope, commands us, this is a universal letter, which means it applies to all Catholics. It's also scripture, so it's pretty important. Always be prepared to give an account when anyone asks you for the hope that is in you. How many times in your life have you been challenged in your faith, whether it's a teaching or why you bother to go to Mass anymore, or how many kids do you have, or whatever it may be, and you've kind of frozen? Right? Preparedness training is about repetition, right? That's why, that's why our law enforcement, that's why our firefighters, they do drills constantly. It's not because there's that many fires. It's because they want to keep their skills sharp. Always be prepared. If we're not practicing this, if we're not engaging in it, uh, we are going to not be prepared. We're not going to be able to deliver and perform in the moment. Most importantly, though, apologetics is not, like I said, it's not about shouting the truth into the void. Apologetics is about removing stumbling blocks for those who are on the road to belief. Apologetics is about removing stumbling blocks for those who are on the road to belief. So it has to have a personal character. You have to know the person. If you don't know the person you're speaking to, you're not doing apologetics. There's plenty, there's the catechism. We don't, people don't need someone to tell them what the truth is. They need someone to love them into the truth. That's what Jesus means. That's what our Lord means when he says, make disciples, teach them to observe. It's more than just shouting the faith. And we need this, right? Kevin talked about it. We can look at all the stats all day long of how the odds are stacked against us. More and more people don't believe in God. They think religion is irrational. Christianity, though, is also a lived faith. So there are people who don't believe, and our, our defense and our explanation of the faith is going to help them maybe come into belief, right? And I've seen that in my work with RCIA, working with adults who want to come into the faith. You know, they all, everyone has something, some issue, right, that's kind of like the, the linchpin for them. And just a, over time, right, a calm, rational explanation of it and walking with them and loving them and being in friendship with them has allowed them to remove that stumbling block over time over time, not once off. So we remove stumbling blocks, but Christianity is also a lived faith. We believe not just that uh, 
the teachings of the church apply to us as Christians, but we believe that there are some really important things that the church teaches, that, that our Lord teaches, that are good for us as human beings. And our world increasingly pushes those aside. For example, we, we defend the sanctity of marriage not because we're offended when we see two people of the same sex try to get married. It's not because we're offended. It's because we know it is not good for them. It is not good for the world. Same with, we're going to talk about gender theory today. We don't push back against gender theory because we want everyone to be a Christian. I mean, we do want everyone to be a Christian. But we push back against gender theory because it is important Sex and gender is important for human flourishing, period, no matter what your belief system is. And so we need to be prepared to talk about those things in the public square. And again, in our world, I don't know if you've looked around lately, but Christendom, that idea that society and culture takes its cues from the Catholic faith and from the church, that time is over. And it's been over for about mo all of our lives, actually. Um, but we're kind of just starting to wake up to that fact. Christendom is dead. Christendom is dead. We live in a new apostolic age. We are going to have to be that suffering. Maybe you'll be called to give an account. That suffering, think about that suffering that Kevin talked about. The third reason why we should care about apologetics. So number one, uh, it helps us understand our faith, which helps us love God better. Number two, it helps us make disciples and lead other people into the truth. And number three, it encourages our fellow believers Right? We live in a culture that's increasingly hostile to objective truth and to the teachings of the church church, and of Christianity. How many of you have ever felt alone at work or on your block or in the grocery store or you're watching TV and you're like, are, are we serious right now? Right? Like, am I the only, how many of you felt alone in that? Probably we've all felt alone and isolated. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin's the only one. How many of you, so you felt alone, how many of you have ever heard someone give a defense of the faith or stand up for a teaching of the church and felt encouraged, right? Because you're like, oh, I'm not alone. I thought I was the only one, right? This is happening, actually, we'll talk, if you come to the gender theory session, we'll talk about this. Uh, the statistics are actually growing positive uh, in uh widespread United States Americans perspective on gender theory that the, st the statistics are going positive. They're trending positively for uh, people who believe that sex and gender are not separable. It's up to 60% of American uh, five years ago, it was down to like 44%, but it's improved 15% in the last five years because people like you have stood up and said, actually, no, this is not good. This is not good. So when we give a good, rational defense of the faith, it helps confirm others in that faith and encourage them that they're not alone. All right, so let's talk a little bit about charity. Because there's this, there's this idea out there in the church, in Catholic spheres, uh, on social media in, per, in particular, that uh, if I just shout the truth loud enough, right, which on social media means I put my caps lock on, right, or if I just say it the right, with the right bit of sarcasm or the right bit of whatever, that that's charity, because truth is always charitable. That is categorically false. And you can look, I can point you to two doctors of the church if you want more, St. Teresa of Avila and St. Francis de Sales, two pretty important people, uh, doctors of the church, uh, who both talked explicitly about being affable, being uh, collegial, being a good person to spend time with before you're going to lead other people to the truth. You cannot be a jerk and do apologetics. Because guess who, guess who it's about if that's what you're doing? It's about you. But what's apologetics about? It's about Christ. It's about the Lord. It's about the truth. St. Paul says it explicitly in 1 Corinthians. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, which means like if I am the most eloquent, best teacher, if I am the best guy, but I and I do it with without love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
I am a noisy gong. It's just noise. If I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, if I have, and, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I have not love, I am not as effective. I am a little bit less. No, I am nothing. I am nothing if I have not love. If I give away all that I have and if I deliver my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Think about that. Kevin talked about the suffering to come. I don't know what your future holds. The ultimate sacrifice might be asked of you. You might be asked to deliver your physical body for the faith. And if you do it without love, Scripture teaches right here, you gain nothing. You gain nothing. There's no consolation prizes for sort of doing this. Peter Kreeft, who's a, you guys know Peter Kreeft, right? He's been at Man of Christ before. Uh, he has this great line. He says, the enemy engaged in apologetics is unbelief, not unbelievers. Sure, I'll say it again. The enemy engaged in apologetics is unbelief, not unbelievers. It is heresy, not heretics. So think about that the next time, or think back to when you've tried to make a defense or have get, gotten a debate about the faith. Was it more about the person you were engaged with and beating them, or was it more about the belief? It's a good check for us. It's super hard to do this. And I'm, I mean, I'm exhibit A. You could go, we were talking about like social media profiles and history. You could go back about 10 years and look at my Facebook account. There are some very unflattering things you could find that I said about people, right? In, in arguments and stuff on Facebook. So I'm guilty of this. Uh, Peter Kree says, insulin attacks diabetes. It does not attack diabetics. That's the analogy he uses. The goal is to come to a greater understanding of the truth. Pope Benedict writes in uh, a, a, an encyclical he wrote called uh, Caritas and Veritate, Charity and Truth. He said, truth needs to be sought, found, and expressed within the economy of charity, but charity in its turn needs to be understood, confirmed, and practiced in the light of truth, which means that we need to love people Right? We need to do this with love and gentleness and reverence. But we also need to do it with the truth. That it is, he's saying at the same time, it is never loving to allow someone to persist in their error. Now, uh, strategically, you might not decide to have the whole conversation right away. And that's okay. Right? You're married. We're, we're men. We've probably done this to our wives where we tried to get it all out at one time. And we thought that would be super efficient and wasn't that the best, like, isn't that great? How did that go for you, right? It doesn't go so well, right? We have to be, we have, charity and love, right? Truth, I'm sorry, truth and love. All right, uh, something that's been sitting with me for a long time, several years, is uh, uh, Jesus in uh, John 14, 6, right? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Later on in, uh, or earlier in John's gospel in chapter eight, he says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Guys, apologetics must be about setting a soul free with the truth. It must be. Guys, Jesus Christ is the Lord of the universe. He's the king of the universe. He's all-powerful. He's God Almighty. He does not need you to give him a pat on the back and an ego boost by proclaiming the truth into the void and just shouting it at people. He doesn't need us for that. He doesn't really even want that. He knows he's the truth. He doesn't need any help. What he wants, though, is he wants to set souls free with the truth. And that means a very different thing. I could go bomb a prison and the walls would come crumbling down. But if I do that, there's not going to be any prisoners to leave. So I can't pretend that I'm setting people free right? by launching missiles at prison walls. I got to go in and I got to unlock the cell and lead them out. That's what apologetics is. 
All right, so assuming that, because you haven't left yet, that you want to do this, uh, how do we do this? I'm going to give you, uh, first, before we do these 10 steps, I'm going to give you five things is on your sheets real quickly. Uh, number one, how to be a good witness, how to be a good apologist. Number one, you need to build a habit of prayer and discipleship. Simply put, you cannot give what you don't have. Second, you need to live as a witness. Pope Paul VI, in a document called Evangelii Nunciandi, which in English means evangelization in the modern world, he said, modern man no longer listens to teachers, but to witnesses. And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are also witnesses. If your life doesn't look different than your neighbor's without having to tell them you're a Christian, you're doing something wrong or you're missing something. There should be joy in what we do. And the way that we live our life should be such, we should be carrying ourselves with such joy and, so, and joy doesn't mean like happy, bouncy, right? But with such peace and freedom that when our neighbors look over at us and they see us raking our leaves like they have to do, they see us mowing our lawn, they see us doing all these things, they see it, but they can intuit that we're doing it with something deeper. Have you noticed that about someone? You ever met someone like that? They do everything that you do, but they do it in a way that's different. And you're not sure what it is. And what do you do when you encounter that? You go up to them and say, like, Can, I'm sorry, this is weird, but, like, something is different about you, and I need to understand why. If you are living your life as a witness, you won't have to go out looking for people to evangelize. They are going to come to you and ask you. And then you're going to remember 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an account to anyone who asks you for your, the reason for your hope. Which is the third part, be ready to speak. You have to know your faith. Study it. We live in a time, guys, this is, we have never lived in a time in the church where we've had such easy access to the faith. We talked about the church fathers. Even 100 years ago, do you know what you had to do to read the church fathers? Well, first you had to know Latin and be fluent in Latin. Then you had to go to a library. Remember those things? It's like this brick building, right? They give you like a little cart. No, like, you would have to put so much effort in to learn and read the church fathers today. You can literally Google it on your phone and you have St. Irenaeus pulled up in five seconds. We live in such a beautiful time because it's such easy access to the truths and the deep riches of our faith. Know it, study it. To whom much is given, much is, is expected, right? The Lord says that in the gospels. He has given you easy access to all of this. I don't know what he's going to do at your particular judgment, but he might ask you like, hey, did you learn any of this? Did you seek any of this? Because it doesn't take a lot. So learn it. Study it. Know your testimony. Know your account. Know your reason for your hope. When someone asks you, you know, hey, wow, you have six kids. That must be a lot. Like, don't just shrug it off. Like, do you have a, do you have a response? Why are you going, why are you waking up on a Sunday to go to church? Do you have a response that's not, oh, it's what I always do. That's a dumb response, guys. Be better. We got to be better than that. Sometimes we're tired, and I get it. All right, number four, we got to cultivate relationships and friendships. We've been hitting this. We're beating a dead horse here. But the faith is spread person to person. If you don't know people, if you don't know them deeply, you're not going to be able to lead them to Christ. You have to have a trusting relationship with them first. And number five, uh, count the cost. Because when you start doing this, there's going to be consequences. And it's going to be different for every one of us. Maybe it's simply inconvenience. But maybe it's lost friendships. Maybe it's lost family relationships or strained family relationships. Maybe, maybe it's something deeper than that. But we got to count the cost and be ready to embrace the consequences that come from being a witness to the faith. Amen? You're still with me? All right. I like numbers and lists. So, all right. So when you want to have the conversation, now this is not the conversation with like your teenage boy. No. Um, but when you want to have a conversation with someone about the faith, here are some 10 things to keep in mind. Oops, number one, pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance. Ask yourself very quickly, and you can do this interiorly. You don't have to do it like, I would advise you not to do it out loud in front of them. Um, ask real quickly in, in your heart, is this the right time for this conversation? If the answer is no, that's okay. 
That's okay. Is the conversation geared towards my desire to speak the truth or to set this heart free with the truth? And if there is any inkling that it's really about you or win an argument or feeling, you know, kind of, yeah, I'm going to go defend the faith, don't have that conversation. Disengage and pray about it more and then come back to it. All right, pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance. Number two, demonstrate love and mercy. Very easily today in our world, we have a hard time as people separating our beliefs from our identity. We have to keep this in mind. It's, it happens to us, right? Uh, it happened in line here today. Kevin said, hey, oh, Marquette won last night. You know what my response was? Oh, volleyball? And you guys, you should have seen the look on his face. Because his belief that there's only one sport at Marquette High and that it's football is so ingrained in his identity that he was like, he had a visceral reaction when I made that careless mistake. And it was my careless mistake, Kevin. We have a hard time, all of us do, separating our beliefs from our identity. Everyone that we talk to is the same way. We have to come overly compensating with love and mercy towards someone. This is, I mean, if you know, like, communication stuff, this is, this is like, you know, 101 stuff. But, like, use we, us language, right? Don't, your fingers should not be pointed in an outward direction at all during these conversations, right? Yes, don't, don't do that. Don't, try not to say you. Try to say we, us. Uh, throughout that conversation, affirm your positive feelings for them and your relationship. Like, it's a good idea, I would say, to, um, to pause even in, when, maybe when things start to get heated, pause and say, hey, I just want to, like, just pause here for a second and say, I, I really love you, and I'm so thankful for our friendship. And, like, we're having this conversation, and, and it's getting, you know, we're talking about real stuff, and that's important. But it doesn't change how I feel about you and the amount that I care about you. Yes. Good. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Um, your basic communication skills, like, uh, and from the secular world, are going to come into you know uh, into play here. That's really helpful. Good. Uh, number three. Uh, invite explanation and listen with understanding. So sometimes when we talk to people or when we're engaged in like a debate on the faith, uh, we kind of take the defensive, right? Because people say they, they make the accusation or they make, like they start peppering us with questions. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? What about this? Right? We got to just remain calm. I know for men, for us, that's hard to do, right? Remain calm. Don't see red, right? Whatever your calming color is, maybe it's green or blue. Just think about nice blue things. Think about the Bears losing to the Packers. Uh, I'm a Bears fan, so I can make that joke. Um, I am too. Um, thank you. Thank you. But a couple questions you can ask. A couple questions you can always ask because it's important to turn. It's important to ask questions of them too, right? You're not on trial. This is a conversation. So questions you could ask. Number one, very basically, well, what do you believe? What do you believe? It helps uh, when you're in this conversation, it gets their cards on the table, right? What do they actually think? That's totally fair to do. It makes them reflect on their beliefs because often, maybe you've experienced this, often when people come to us and kind of pepper us with questions, it's not because they uh, care a whole lot about the topic. It's because they saw a 10 second YouTube clip about Catholicism, right? or something they read on social media. So asking them, well, what do you believe? Maybe they'll say, oh, I actually don't know. Well, now it's not a simple apologetics conversation. Now it's about their beliefs. And now you can start having a real conversation. Uh, another question you could ask, how did you come to believe that? How did you come to believe that? That's a really important one because so many things, especially when we talk about sexual issues, right? And sexual morality in the church, whether it's gender theory or LGBT stuff or, you know, marriage or divorce, they're not asking because it's an intellectual question for them. They're asking because their brother is experiencing this or their parent or their child. And that is a whole other conversation, isn't it? It is no longer about the teaching of the church. And if we expect to just have a rational conversation, and even though we're smiley about it uh, and we expect it to all be good, we are sorely mistaken. 
Because again, apologetics is about setting the heart free, not about just winning an argument. How did you come to believe that? All right, number four, uh, ask clarifying questions and then listen some more, right? Uh, another question you can ask someone, why do you think that's true? Why do you think that's true? Here's what I believe. How'd you come to believe that? Well, why do you think that's true? Again, this challenges their belief and it forces them to dig deeper. So if their whole understanding of the topic is a 20 second YouTube video, it's gonna become apparent very quickly because they're not gonna be able to articulate why they believe that, right? Why they think that's true. Another question you can always ask too is why, what do you mean by blank, right? This reminds me of uh, like Bill Clinton in the 90s, President Clinton, right? Uh, well, it depends on what your definition of the word is is right um a big problem in our world is that definitions words don't have definitions anymore and so how many times are you in a conversation and you're talking past and it's really heated and you realize that like the words you're arguing about you don't, actually don't even have the same definition for Has that ever happened to you and then you're like well i meant this and you're like oh well that's that's what i meant too right like it's so always ask what do you mean by that what do you mean by marriage that's a big one what do you mean by marriage? What do you mean by, you know, uh, God, right? When we go to the atheism on a question, what do you, when you say God, what does that mean for you? Because a lot of times when you talk, when I talk to people who say they don't believe in God or they're an atheist and I ask them, well, what's your definition of God? What, what do you mean by God? And they tell me, I was like, oh, I don't believe in that either, right? It's <laughs> like, there's a book by a guy named John Leonetti. It says, uh, it's about atheism. It says, your God is too boring. I love that book. It, your God is too boring. I don't believe in that God either. Here's the God I do believe in, though. Would you like to talk more about that? You can ask this one like 30 times in a conversation. What do you mean by blank? All right, so you're going to ask clarifying questions. And again, it's not about you just like winning an argument, but it's you forcing your discussion partner to really consider what they do believe. And the more you're doing that, the more you're building the relationship, because who doesn't like to hear themselves talk, right? And the more you're going to be able to see how your response needs to be crafted, right? So step five, discern what the person needs and respond accordingly. Well, you found out that this is a really personal family issue for them. So I have to have a very like loving, overly loving approach to this. I can't just spew out a couple of scripture verses. I don't believe in scripture. Well, I can't really use scripture as my backbone for this discussion if that person doesn't believe in scripture, can I? Well, the catechism says this. Well, if they're not Catholic, who give, like, why should they care what the Pope says if they're not Catholic? So all these questions help us discern what that person needs and is going to help us respond lovingly and accordingly. Number six, proclaim the deeper yes behind the church's teaching. The deeper yes. I don't know if you've realized this, right? Like a lot of the church's teachings on specific things are not about that thing but it's about safeguarding something else. It's because something else is true that this necessarily is true. Why do we believe Mary is the mother of God? The teaching, the dogma on Mary as the Theotokos, the mother of God, has nothing to do with Mary. It's about Jesus. We believe Mary is the mother of God because Jesus is fully God and fully man. And if Mary's not the mother of God, that means one of those things isn't true about Jesus, and we have a problem then, don't we? So there's always a deeper yes behind every teaching of the church. This takes this is where learning and studying the faith is going to help you. You're going to be able to diagnose that quickly. What's the real thing here? What's the real golden thread behind this teaching of the church? A question you can ask at this point in your conversation, too. Uh, this, is, this is a lovely trick I learned. Uh, it helps... You, you ask, uh, how would you respond to someone who says blank? And then guess what? You just put in what you want to say. Because now if they want to beat up on someone because that offends them, it's not you. It's this fictitious imaginary person that you just made up. Well, how would you respond to someone who says marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman? You haven't told them that that's what you believe yet. And now their vitriol, if there is any, is going to be directed at this imaginary person, not at you, which is good for your conversation and your relationship, right? So proclaim the deeper yes. Number seven, 
Uh, explain the, per the fullness of the teaching with personal witness. Sometimes this is hard. Well, what's your personal witness to apostolic succession? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a bishop. Right? But think through some of those things. How does your life, how has this teaching touched your life? If it has, how can you incorporate that in? Because guess what? Someone cannot put down your story. They can't argue against your experience, which is kind of relativistic, but we're going to use it to our advantage in these conversations. Include your personal witness. Number eight, invite further dialogue and respond without defensiveness. We got to pray throughout the conversation, guys. We got to pray for peace. We got to pray for tranquility of heart. We'll talk about this at the end of our day. Those are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Peace. Kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are fruits of the Holy Spirit. What is a fruit on a tree? It's a sign that it's living, right? So if those things are missing, if the fruits of the Holy Spirit are missing from your conversation or missing from your life, what does that mean? It means that to that extent, the Holy Spirit is missing in your life. You're not living in the Holy Spirit. We got to be very leery of that as Christians. When we start missing the fruits, it means that the tree, something is sick in the tree. We got to examine that. Uh, number nine, provide a resource for deeper understanding or do more research yourself. It is always okay in a conversation to say, hey, you know what? I don't really know that very well. Can I, can I do a little research and, and point you to a couple things? Number one, it shows your humility, which is going to win you more affection from that person. And number two, you're going to be able to, instead of you fumbling through what you remembered Scott Hahn saying on that YouTube video you watched or Mike Brumman that one Saturday at St. Mary's Visitation, like you can just like pull up the YouTube link and say, hey, I found this video. Why not like, boom, or here's this article. Um, be careful with that. Right, my rule is like five minutes or less. Right, I have people who have sent me like 50 minute videos on things. Guess what? I clicked on the link and saw 50. You know, I was like, nope, X. I'm not, I don't look at, I don't have, who has 50 minutes? Right, but there's a ton. Uh, I'll give you some resources at the end of the day. I, they're on your sheet too. Uh, Catholic Answers, great website, has short, concise things and then other things to, for them to learn more. Right, provide a resource. And number 10, Build the relationship and agree to talk more later. Because, guys, is this about winning an argument? No. Wrong. It is not about winning an argument. It is about setting a heart free with the truth. In almost every situation, it's not going to happen in one conversation. And I know we're men and we like efficiency, and that would be awesome. But guess what would happen if every time, if, if God allowed us to lead a soul into the truth every conversation? How many people would it take for you to start thinking it was not God, but it was you? For me, it's like half a person. Like in the middle, like, I'm doing really good, right? Like that out of body, like, man, that was a really good answer. Like, I, our pride gets sucked in so easily. Be prepared to fail in this because the Lord wants us to fail. He wants us to fail so that we learn to depend on him more and also to preserve our own souls. Because when we start getting prideful about any of this, we now, now, the, now the enemy has won two souls instead of one. Right? We started with me. I was in good shape. But now in this argument, now the, the enemy has gained two souls. Because I've now sinned, I've committed the sin of anger, or I've had the sin of pride, or whatever. So always come back in humility, build this relationship, and agree to talk more later. Affirm them. Because the enemy of apologetics is not the unbeliever. It's the unbelief. It's not the heretic. It's the heresy. Pro tip, it's not really uh, productive to call someone a heretic to their face. And I, I've had no conversations where I've said, hey, do you know you're a heretic? And they say, 
oh, thank you for telling me. I had no idea. Please tell me. Like, I mean, just, just to kind of throw it out there, right? This is relationships. We have to keep pushing on about this. 